A Problem of Power A Journal of the Holy Spirit's Activity in the Life of an Average Christian By Connie Cook Read by the Author Chapter 10 Is God Angry? For one period of my life, from the ages of about 16 to 20, I entered a time of prolonged spiritual struggle. As I've mentioned, I grew up in the church and I was saved when I was very young. But when I was about 16, I began doing a lot of questioning. I didn't question if God existed. I knew He did. I'd already done all the questioning I needed to do on that front to realize that there were no satisfactory explanations for anything outside of God. My wrestlings were not even so much with the issue of whether the Bible is true. I'd also wrestled that one through. It was a relatively easy one. I'd realized there were no satisfactory explanations for that book outside of it being God's book. What I questioned was me. I questioned us. As I've described, the questions that plagued me were, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with us? And is God angry? With me? With us? Those years of questioning are the reason this book exists. As I've said, I can't claim to have found complete answers to all my questions on this problem of power in the Christian life, in my Christian life at least, but there have been exciting discoveries along the way while looking for answers. The most foundational discoveries I learned were the subjects of my first chapters that all the rest are built on. 1. I am, in fact, saved. I am, in Christ. Very foundational to everything else. Then, 2. Being in Christ, He is also in me. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And 3. God's got it all under control, He's even got me under control. Everything, even my life, is going according to His plan. I am in Christ. I am indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, God is doing His perfect work in me. While I have a role in cooperating with Him, and He requires me to turn the controls of myself over to Him voluntarily, it is His work, and He'll do it. In Chapter 3, I explained briefly a big part of the reason for my years of struggling and questioning. The anger of God as I saw it in the Bible. What brought about my years of doubt was me wondering if the church of today just might not be in the same position as those who were the recipients of God's anger in the Bible. One of the most exciting discoveries I've made in all my journey of discovery is the subject of this chapter. To make a long story short, the answer is, no, God is not angry at us. God is not angry at me. The point of this chapter, to cut to the chase, is that we, as believers in Christ, are not in that position. This may be elementary, my dear Watson, to a lot of you, but I'm convinced that a great many Christians have not completely grasped this truth. When I see many, many Christians living under guilt and condemnation and a persistent fear of God's anger, just as I did during my struggling years, I realize that what I have to share in this chapter may be helpful to some. I think the first thing we need to have clear in a discussion on the anger of God is the difference between the Old and New Covenants. Hebrews 8 addresses the topic of the difference between the two and says this, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Hebrews 8, 7. And then chapter 8 closes in this way. In that, he says, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Hebrews 8.13 In the intervening verses between verses 7 and 13 of chapter 8, the writer of Hebrews quotes from Jeremiah 31.31-34. Here are those words from Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Do you see the difference in positions? It's a difference that makes all the difference. 
and while these promises are to the house of Israel and Judah, and may have another fulfillment in the works, the new covenant, according to Hebrews, is the one we, as Christians, live under. Those promises are also for us. What were Jesus' words on his final night before his death? This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Luke 22:20b. The blood of Jesus ushered in the new covenant. Those of us who have entered into that covenant by believing in his perfect sacrifice for us are covered under the protection of that blood and are not subject to God's wrath against our sin any more. We are made righteous by that sacrifice with the righteousness of Christ. Also from the Old Covenant, hear the words on the subject of the New Covenant given to another prophet, Isaiah. Isaiah 54, 7-10 For a mere moment I have forsaken you, but with great mercies I will gather you. With a little wrath I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness I will have mercy on you, says the Lord your Redeemer. For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for as I have sworn that the waters of Noah would no longer cover the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has mercy on you. Wow! Did you catch that part at the end about the covenant of peace? And about God swearing that he would not ever be angry again with those included in that covenant? Those who are dwelling under the new covenant, the covenant of peace, are not dwelling under the anger of God. Our sins are remembered no more. God's kindness shall not depart from us. I know this is simply the message of salvation. Our sins are wiped out and washed away by believing that the life, death, and resurrection of God, the Son, has performed that miracle on our behalf. We can enter into the new covenant through the blood of Jesus, but how slow we are to get a good, firm grasp on the most basic scriptural truths. How slow I am to grasp them, I mean. There is a huge difference in position between ourselves as the saved and the unsaved in the Old Testament, and the unsaved in the New, who found themselves on the receiving end of the anger of God. All the difference in the world. The very religious people in the Old Testament and in the New, who so often fell under God's anger, were not dwellers of the New Covenant. They may have been religious, but it was an outward religion. It didn't go all the way to the heart. The anger of God, as seen throughout the Bible, is an anger born of pain. Not only was, and is, God angry at sin because sin is a thing that always hurts those he loves, and their pain hurts him too. His was and is the anger of rejected love. Nothing hurts like rejected love. And he madly loves those who reject him, even while they provoke his anger. But his anger has always been directed at the unrepentant. The vilest offender who truly believes and repents suddenly finds himself no longer living under the anger of God. This was the case even for those who lived before the time of the installation of the new covenant. Manasseh, certainly one of Judah's worst kings, one of the old covenant's vilest offenders, turned away God's anger by believing and repenting. Second Chronicles 33 Think also of the striking example of the unimaginably violent and corrupt people of Assyria, so history tells us, in the city of Nineveh, who repented at Jonah's preaching. Remember from Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8, the new covenant is written on the hearts of those who have entered into it. That's one major difference between the old covenant and the new. Under the old, the Abrahamic and the Mosaic covenants, merely being born to certain parents in a certain nation and being circumcised, if you happen to be male, was entry into the Old Covenant. No personal choice involved, no inward state of the heart necessary, no repentance required. But under the New Covenant, God's laws are written on hearts. It's all about inward states. No one enters the New Covenant except through personal choice. God is not angry at the repentant, so God is not angry at the dwellers of the new covenant because no one gets to enter the new covenant without repentance. And it's the blood of Jesus that makes possible the cutting of covenants. 
both for those who repented under the old covenant and those who repent into the new it's only that blood that was and is able to purify truly but don't we occasionally see the anger of god directed toward those who are his very own people even in the new testament even toward those who are under the new covenant what about ananias and sapphira acts five one to eleven if it wasn't an act of anger to strike them both dead in an instant what was it or what about the strong words paul uses toward the churches of corinth and galatia don't we see some anger there hebrews twelve five to eleven tells us and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons my son do not despise the chastening of the lord nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him for whom the lord loves he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives if you endure chastening god deals with you as with sons for what son is there whom a father does not chasten but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers then you are illegitimate and not sons furthermore we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live for they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful nevertheless afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it by saying that the dwellers of the new covenant no longer come under god's wrath and anger i'm not saying that we no longer come under god's discipline that would be in direct opposition to what hebrews twelve has to tell us however what i am saying is that he doesn't discipline his own children the dwellers of the new covenant out of anger he disciplines them out of love that's the only way i can fit together isaiah fifty four and hebrews twelve those of us who had good parents can understand the absence of unhealthy fear that exists in a good parent-child relationship in spite of the discipline that has to take place from time to time even though those good parents certainly discipline out of anger occasionally we may have feared the pain of the discipline we may have feared facing our parents after we'd done something wrong yet there was no fear of a severance in the relationship no matter what i'd done knowing i was loved and knowing that my position as a much-loved child was never in jeopardy took away most of the sting from the discipline at least when it was all over and knowing that god isn't angry at me that his heart throbs with love for me makes all the difference when i realize that i've blown it again and god is speaking to me on some particular painful subject or otherwise dealing with me in some painful way even in cases like ananias and sapphira where the discipline came sharply and suddenly or in his stern statements to the churches of corinth and galatia those involved in those disciplinary situations if truly god's children could have the unspeakable blessing of knowing that the discipline was being done out of love not anger even if the discipline took the form of dropping dead in one's tracks for one of god's own children dropping dead in one's tracks is nothing more than a quick painless exit from this sin diseased world and a rapid entrance into a perfect one in god's presence to fear god's anger no longer even in the midst of discipline what a huge and freeing thing it is take a look at another assurance also from the old testament that those who are under the new covenant are not under god's anger this one flips that statement around to state positively that not only is god not angry with us he's pleased with us those of us who are partakers of the new covenant the lord takes pleasure in those who fear him in those who hope in his mercy psalm 147 11. fearing him here is equated with hoping in his mercy that's a vital first step those of us who have entered into the new covenant have taken we've all realized our own desperate need for his mercy knowing what we deserve is not mercy yet he tells us that he takes pleasure in those who hope in his mercy not only is he not angry with them even though they haven't deserved his mercy he's pleased want to know that you're pleasing god 
than hope in his mercy. I want to close this chapter with a story, one that happened to me just yesterday. It brought home for me in a very personal way how it is that God views all his children. First of all, you need to know that I struggle with off-and-on depression and have for years. For me, just a small rolling pebble can start an emotional landslide. I've been on a bit of a landslide this year. We're only into the fourth month of this year, but it's been a long year already. The pebble that started rolling started rolling at the beginning of January. The church I attend has been going through a four-month rough patch and is on the verge of a split. I won't go into a lot of detail. All you need to know is that it's been very hard on all of us who attend, and possibly harder on me than on some others, because I'm a gigantic wimp. Yesterday was Sunday. I attended the morning Sunday service at my church and came away hurting and angry. Not just in general, but at someone in particular. At the very someone who, about half the church would say, was responsible for all the trouble in the first place at someone who, admittedly, has not quite attained perfection yet. And, of course, I thought God should be angry at this person and all his faults as well. Doesn't he get angry at the things that hurt his children? And I was hurt. Sunday afternoon, when I wasn't crying, I was writing in a journal, writing to God, mostly. After ranting and raving for some time about my problem person, and realizing, of course, that the only option was to forgive, then, after some further ranting and raving about what a mess the world is, and what a mess the body of Christ is, and what a mess I am, I closed my journaling the only way I could, by crying out to God for deliverance. Eventually I stopped crying, ranting, and raving, calmed down and got ready to go to the evening service. In the Sunday evening service, one of the most godly young women I've ever known took the service to share about her recent short-term mission trip. During her talk, she mentioned that she'd lived most of her Christian life under a false impression that was very familiar to me. I always had the feeling that God was disappointed in me, she said, before going on to tell us how she'd been freed from that false impression, and how life-changing it was to realize who she was in Christ. As I sat listening to her, I said to her, just in my head and heart, Darling, do you have any idea how precious you are to God? How precious you always were? Knowing her as I do, I couldn't imagine a time that God was disappointed in that beautiful, radiant, generous, loving spirit he'd given her. But for so long she'd been unable to see it. And I hadn't been able to help her see it, even though I'd taught her in Sunday school and Bible study. It had to be the Spirit's work in her life, and only his work that helped her see it. After the evening service, I sat up late talking to another beautiful, precious young lady, one very close to me, who had also been at the evening service. We talked about what we'd heard at the service and discussed Satan's deceptions and how good he is at making us believe his lies about the way God sees us. She said to me, I can see how God feels about us when I look at other people like the young lady we were discussing, but it is a hard thing to believe when I look at myself. And looking at her, all I could think was, Darling, do you have any idea how precious you are to God? I have some idea, because I know how precious you are to me. Before I fell asleep, I did a little more reading in the book I'd picked up earlier, Philip Yancey's Prayer. Reading the experiences of many dear ones who've lived with major, unanswered prayers for years, and yet have gone on praying and seeking, even in the midst of doubt and disillusionment, who refuse to let go of God entirely, because they know there's just nothing else worth hanging on to, in my mind I could only say to them, Do you have any idea how precious you are to God? Do you have any idea how precious it is to Him to see a faith that goes through fire and comes out the other side with that little nugget of true gold left? Philip Yancey at one point writes feelingly about doubt, about Job and his doubts, about himself and his own doubts, and I thought, Job's faith was so precious to God, not because he didn't doubt, but because he did. But he hung on, anyway. And I thought, Philip, do you have any idea how precious you are to God? He might. I have a hunch he's experienced what I'm talking about this chapter. And then I finally heard him. I heard that inaudible whisper saying to me, My beloved, do you know how precious you are to me? 
How precious your faith is to me. I remembered my long afternoon of lapsing back into depression and bad attitude and anger and my fellow Christian and my feelings of despondency, of wondering what's wrong with the body of Christ and where is God's work in the world. And I remembered what a mess I was. Do you know how precious it is to me when you go through the fire? Don't you know how precious it is to me when you cry out to me for help in the midst of your need and your messiness? Don't you know how precious you are to me, beloved? Yes, I really think he said all that to me. And all I could do was whisper back, Yeah, I think I do. I should. It's a lesson he's taught me often. But he wasn't finished whispering. Then he whispered, Don't you know how precious he is to me? And by he, he meant the person I had been angry at earlier. Gulp. Yeah, I guess I knew that, too. And then I could see it. Then I could see how precious he is to God, in spite of his faults. The two young women I told you about, they have faults, too. I know that. And it isn't exactly that I'm blind to their faults. But I don't see those faults because I'm not looking at them. Seeing through the eyes of love, all I can see is how precious they are. I can begin, just begin, to understand what God sees when he sees them. I can even see it in my own case. Even though I can certainly see that I'm a mess, I can see that it is infinitely precious to him when we call out to him from the midst of our mess. Yet when it came to my problem person, all I could see were faults. I was not looking at him through the eyes of love. But God was, and is. And once he began to open my eyes, I began to see how precious he is to God, too. It's because we imagine that God sees things the way we do, that we wrestle with these fears of disappointing him, of angering him. Occasionally we look at ourselves the way we look at others, and then we're horrified. That must be what God sees. But that is not what God sees. God does not look at us the way we do. And that is one of the beautiful things about having God live within us. He begins to make us able to look at ourselves and others the way he does. Even the ones we don't naturally see as precious, because all we can see are their faults. I bet that Ananias and Sapphira now understand how precious they are to him. I bet the churches of Galatia and Corinth also have that much clearer vision. And I am also beginning to see all of those precious yet messy ones slightly differently, as well as seeing the words of chastening he spoke to them differently too. After my experience of yesterday, I had a different take on the chastening of Hebrews 12, 5-11. How painful and yet how gentle God's chastening can be, all at the same time. Was my chastening of yesterday joyful? No, it was painful in the moment. And yet after I began to see the point of it, and it began to yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness, after I began to see a little more through his eyes and heard him whisper his words of immense love to me, was it worth it? It was so worth it. I can trust God to do the same work in the life of those other precious, yet in need of refining ones, that I was busy thinking about all day yesterday. He loves them too much not to do His refining work in their lives. He loves us too much not to draw the realities of what we are at present, inch by grueling inch, closer towards the real reality, as He sees it, of what we will one day be. He loves us too much to keep us from the pain of the fire. Now, it's perfectly true that the faith in the fire that he finds so precious is really his work. Isn't it a little like God loving himself through us? Well, considering that he made us, and that all good things can only come from him, I suppose that's one way to look at it. But when we give back to him what he gave us in the first place, in some mysterious way that I can't explain, it becomes really and truly our gift to give him. It is precious to him. And about the only thing we can give him is our desperate plea for help. But that's what he's waiting to hear. For the dwellers of the new covenant, that is where every one of us have started. We've admitted that we need his help, and that is precious. We are precious to him. Not in spite of our need, but because of our need. So let me ask you, and it is a life-impacting, no, a life-transforming question. Do you know how precious you are to him?'